Nuclear batteries have long been a topic that sparks imagination, using a radioactive material that slowly decays over hundreds, maybe thousands of years to provide a constant electrical output. A battery that as a consequence would never need recharging makes my physicist brain giddy with excitement. There have already been a number of startups competing to develop this technology, but just announced BetaVault, a Chinese startup, may have finally delivered on the promise of a mass producible, limitless battery technology. But is this something we've all heard before it all sounds great in principle, but Arc and Light, the UK startup, has been radio silent for about seven months now, and the California startup, NDB, as of September 2023, is under investigation by the SEC with reports that it oversold claims to investors about its nano diamond battery capabilities. So, is this a scam or not? Most of the written coverage so far has been a rewording of BetaVault's press release, there isn't much information out about it, but today I'm going to take some time to cover this topic with my other hat on, running an investment fund that invests in early stage scientific breakthroughs. So let's look at this technology, but let's also ask ourselves, will this actually change our lives or is this just a pipe dream? Let's start with the easy stuff, nuclear physics. Good morning and welcome to Nuclear Physics 101. The concept of using radioactive materials in battery-like applications dates back to the 1950s and 60s, with initial research focused on military and space applications. The first class of nuclear batteries were known as radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs, or radioisotope batteries. They used a radioactive isotope like plutonium-238 or strontium-90 to produce heat, and then turned that heat into electricity. What does that actually mean? Heat is just a measure of the average speed of particles in a system. Heat here just describes the fact that the particle that decays from these radioisotopes comes off moving really, really fast, increasing the average speed of particles overall. This radioactive source was sandwiched next to a thermoelectric material, possibly something like lead telluride. As the fast moving particles hit one side of the lead telluride, they heat it up. In thermoelectric materials, this heat gradient can cause charge carriers, either electrons or electron holes to move from the hot side to the cold side, creating a small voltage or current. This is called the Seebeck effect. The rate of decay and the heat produced depend on the specific isotope that's used, but ultimately these devices were always pretty large, expensive, and only produced very limited power output, meaning that their usage became limited to failure is not an option scenarios, often in things like extreme environments like space, and they saw use in cases like the Voyager probes and the Galileo and Cassini orbiters and the Mars Curiosity rover. The USSR also used them to power lighthouses in particularly remote locations. Ultimately, later more advanced versions were used to power things like pacemakers and other implanted medical devices, but were ultimately limited in number. These radioisotope thermoelectric generators, or RTGs, can be wildly expensive. The RTGs used for curiosity and perseverance were $109 million. They do, however, provide power for 14 years of continuous use, but only about 125 watts, and in a package weighing 45 kilos. Not the most practical system for your laptop, but at least the 2 kilowatts of heat that they produce would keep your feet warm. The problem with RTGs, other than their size, cost, weight, and limited power output, was that converting energy through heat is always reasonably inefficient. So researchers began looking at a new class of devices that would operate more like solar panels, but for radioactive particles converting them directly into electricity. Rather than solar panels or photovoltaics, these devices are called alpha, beta, or gamma voltaics, depending on whether they capture alpha particles, which are helium atoms, beta particles, which are electrons, or gamma particles, which are just gamma ray photons. BetaVolt, as you may have guessed from the name, is developing a beta voltaic device based on beta particles or electrons. The radioactive source that they're using is nickel-63, which once it has decays, converts into a stable non-radiative isotope of copper, so nice and environmentally friendly. The nickel-63 is placed next to a semiconductor material so that when the high-energy electron impacts the semiconductor, it knocks an electron out of where it wants to be within the material, creating an electron-hole pair. These electron-hole pairs want to recombine with each other. If you connect a wire to the top and bottom of the panel, electrons will rush to recombine with holes, and you can use the current flow to do useful electrical work. One of the interesting parts here though is that most semiconductor materials, due to the structure and way that they're made, are very susceptible to damage from radiation, which degrades the material over time, reducing its efficiency. Both BetaVault and Arkenlight, the UK startup, use semiconductors made from incredibly thin layers of diamond, because diamond is a very radiation hard material, meaning it resists degradation. Diamond's also a good material to use because there's comparatively a very large band gap of about 5.5 electron volts, which is the difference between the energy levels of 
the conduction band and valence bands. This means two things. One, that it can capture more energy from decaying electrons that would otherwise be lost to heat, heating up the material. But two, that large band gap is useful because it makes it difficult for the created electron hole pairs to then recombine, increasing the carrier lifetime and making the device more efficient overall. Where I've seen these diamond layers created before is through a process called chemical vapor deposition. You can create ultra thin layers, one on top of the other, so you can build essentially a many layer sandwich of alternating radioisotope diamond semiconductor layers, which I assume is what's happening in this picture in Betavolt's press release. As a passing thought, although we're calling this a nuclear battery, battery isn't really the right term because it isn't storing energy. It's more of a nuclear generator, which might be a much cooler technology to talk about. That's the science. Anyway, let's talk about the specs. Betavolt isn't the first to work on this concept, like we said. Taking the information that they provide totally at face value, because I think that's all we can do for now, their edge appears to be in their energy density and energy output. The arc and light systems were aiming to produce between five to 10 microwatts, Betavolt's battery is looking to produce 100 microwatts at 3 volts for a similar size system. These batteries could obviously then be connected together in series or in parallel to reach higher voltages or powers as needed. Okay, so all of this sounds great in principle, but like we said, Arc and Light looks to kind of be MIA and NDB is in trouble with the SEC. How many three letter acronyms can I fit in a paragraph? Yeah. My question remains, is this a compelling innovation or is this a bit of a scam and a pipe dream? As a bit of a caveat here, I'm based in Bristol where Arkenlight is also based. So yes, I obviously looked at them as an investment opportunity and it's publicly available information. I chose not to invest. I really liked the team. I did my own PhD down the hole from where they are based and they are fantastic as a team of scientists. Where I couldn't get comfortable, I guess, was in the more mundane stuff. They were bringing five different products to market simultaneously, which is just a really hard thing to do, even for the best, most experienced entrepreneurial teams in the world. The round dynamics were also just a little bit off for me and I was worried about a couple of the technical details, specifically access to materials and could they scale it up to the volume that is needed. And largely that's because I consider the most interesting markets to be looking at were those very high volume markets. Material availability and manufacturing approach need to be able to handle that. And all this is to say that they might not be out there doing something absolutely fantastic that I'm not aware of. I hope they do and good luck to them, but it wasn't right when I first saw them. And before I go any further on Beautiful, I want to emphasize this is not investment advice. Do your own research and make sensible decisions. But from a first pass with very limited information that we have available to us, I like some of the narrative that is coming out behind Betavolt. They are focusing specifically on their ability to do that larger mass production. Mass production of a simple cell in the first instance, the BV100. And China here where the team is based, yes, used to be known for cheap labor. Honestly, nowadays it's better known for just having world leading capability in machining and tooling. The press release seems to emphasize that their key advantage is in their large area doping of diamond semiconductors, producing these things essentially at scale, which I know for a fact the capability does exist in China and they are very proficient at doing that. However, and this is where my positive review maybe ends, is the reporting overhyping the technology's capability? Probably 100% yes. Uh, and they present actually a really confusing position in that press release. First thing that catches my eye is they aren't at PCT yet with their patents, which means their first patents were filed reasonably recently, less than say 12 months ago. I'm not really sure as a result what level of technology readiness their product actually is. Is it an interesting proof of concept in a science lab or is it actually something they can produce at scale? My guess would probably be the former that this is a very early stage technology still, which might mean that the scale up and the hard process that that is still is to come and that it will be several more years till these things are actually in the market properly. But they don't give ultimately very much information here, so I might be totally wrong on this read. The numbers that they present is also kind of confusing. The current unit is 100 microwatts, but by 2025 they aim to have a one watt unit. Again, with such limited information, it's hard to understand what they are actually proposing here, but my assumption would be sticking a bunch of these 100 microwatt units together until they get to a one watt unit. That would mean about 10,000 of these 100 microwatt units, in which case we're looking at something that is 15 millimeters by 15 millimeters by about 50 meters long if they wedge them all just in a straight line, or obviously multiple fractional pieces of that, but that's a less fun way to visually imagine it. That is a volume of about 0.01 cubic meters, which is about the volume of half a microwave, if that's a useful metric to look up. 
Total guess, but if it, that is made from about 50% diamond and 50% nickel, say, then that is about 70 kilos of weight to get one watt of power. To put that in perspective, the DJI Phantom 4 has an 81 watt hour battery and flies for about half an hour, meaning it has an average power output of about 160 watts. So looking at their later claims, could it power a drone that would never need to land? Well, only with a heck of a lot of diamonds and obviously the weight that was added to it. In the short term at least, this idea probably is not getting off the ground. My overall feeling though, is that the numbers as a whole feel weird and the claims don't quite line up with the specs. This isn't unusual as reporting often takes numbers at face value and is enforced to build out a bigger, more sensationalized version of the science or the business ambition to actually get attention. The core science breakthrough could still be meaningful. So let's step back and ask, but is there actually a market for these batteries? My opinion here is a qualified yes. For the consumer markets, this technology needs a huge amount of energy density improvement to be useful. I'm skeptical that they will proceed at their claimed pace, but rest assured if they develop a compact and affordable one watt nuclear battery, I will be back here to tell you about it. Some particularly low power consumer electronics like watches consume mere microwatts. However, here you can already get 100 microwatt solar panels that are incredibly small, and there are many watches that use solar panels with barely visible panels at all. For this battery to be useful to consumers, it will require an application where they there's no sunlight or even indoor lighting in a place that is very difficult to reach or service. For general consumers, we don't have that many of those opportunities. Betavolt's batteries are most interesting in what I would consider kind of boring markets like logistics and maybe industrial IoT, maybe medical applications. Having a low power tracker though on every single shipping container beaming its location around the world would be useful and isn't done at the moment because you need hundreds of people employed just to be changing out the batteries of these things. Equally having reporting devices stuck on pipes or infrastructure every X number of meters would help companies identify leaks or problems with hard to access or remote or expansive equipment. I think there is potential in medical implants and nuclear powered pacemakers have been used before, obviously. They had an excellent reliability record lasting, I think, decades, typically outliving the users. They also demonstrated that radioactive materials could be used safely, which is particularly impressive as they embedded plutonium right next to people's hearts. Part of these technologies downfall actually was that because the pace of pacemakers improvement was so rapid, it was actually useful to pull out the old one and put in a new one because the technology had just fundamentally improved, even though it's battery hadn't run out at that point. I also think the lithium ion batteries are doing well at the moment and their pace of improvement is still rapid, particularly as we're getting closer to solid state batteries in the market. I would anticipate that the market tends in that direction rather than towards nuclear batteries. There are definitely opportunities for this technology out there, but I wouldn't say they're quite as sexy as what was put on the tin, which was the forever flying drone. But potentially those opportunities are still multi-billion dollar opportunities in their own right. So an interesting business to think about, but obviously all this assumes that their claims play out. And honestly, I think that's where a lot of that science breakthrough reporting gets stuck. Because these news stories need to be somewhat sensationalized to feel pertinent and relevant to our lives, but also that so often in these narratives, this is early stage science and the timeline to actually get it into the marketplace still is very long, which ultimately ends up with everyone feeling a little bit dissatisfied at the end of the day. I think that clarity though is important here. Otherwise investors end up putting money into pipe dreams. I'm looking at you here, Elizabeth. And we need to support the real technologies that will actually move the needle on improving lives. Sadly, the recent reporting has been particularly lacking in this clarity and analysis. And that's why I wanted just to add my two cents to the conversation. What do you think? Let me know in the comments down below. If you want to follow my investment work that I do, I'm raising a fund at the moment, so I can't say too much about it, but I'll leave a link in the description where you can find out a little bit more about my activity. If you like this sort of content, leave a like and let me know where else you think nuclear batteries might be useful, or if you've seen any particularly outrageous scientific claims in the press recently. And check out this video that I did where I've left it probably in the description down below about a real technology that I do think is coming to market probably this year, solid state batteries. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.